please join me in welcoming the first finalist team, team from Microsoft. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor uh, to be able to represent Microsoft this year in the, uh, the work that we've done. Uh, I'm joined on stage by uh, a number of members of the team. These are the folks that actually did the hard work, uh, and they're going to come up successively and, uh, and talk about the work that's been done. In particular, uh, John, I think, is going to start after me. Uh, Jay will come up, uh, but we have the rest of the team here as well for the, uh, the Q&A sessions. So let me uh, take you through, um, you know, sort of uh, an outline that will include first uh, a setup of the problem, you know, e-commerce and the fraud problem that exists related to e-commerce, uh, our approach and the solution that we've built to deal with this problem, the impact that it's had on Microsoft and that we expect it to have uh, from a portability perspective on the, mar the economy at large and our customers. We're taking this technology, we're productizing it, and making it available to our customers and our partners globally. So just a, you know, a quick backdrop before we get into the details of the solution. If you look at what's happening globally across the economy, industries uh, are in transition. Uh, it's amazing, in fact, to see uh, the impact that data, technology, intelligence, artificial intelligence, are having across industry after industry. If you look at Airbnb with the disruption of the hoteling industry, Uber uh, with a complete transformation, the idea of uh, transportation, uh, Amazon uh, with the transition of e-commerce in the retail industry all up. And so industry by industry by industry, there is transformative change happening. And if you think about uh, sort of why, you know, what's at the bottom of a lot of the changes that we're seeing, it really starts from data. Data is increasingly coming out of everything. If you think about a manufacturer historically that creates products and services, delivers them into the marketplace, in the past, any product that gets sort of delivered to a customer uh, is, is, is invisible in many ways to that manufacturer once it leaves the, the manufacturing facility or the warehouse, unless you go inspect it. But today, that product, interactions with customers, your people are all sending a constant stream of data. And if you can take all of that data and analyze it and gain insight into the operation of that piece of equipment or the interaction with that customer, you're in a position to go fundamentally change the way you interact with your customers, taking that intelligence, that point of view, and now acting from a position of knowledge uh, a position of intelligence, and that's transformative. Uh, and that, of course, creates even more data, which goes back into the center. And so you get this continuous feedback loop in many ways of data leading to intelligence, transforming these operations, and continuing to do it. And it's happening across every aspect of business, customers, products, people, your operational systems. Now, at the tip of the spear of this digital transformation opportunity is e-commerce. It's sort of the last mile, if you will, where that relationship with the customer, the delivery of your products, your services, where all of your operational systems sort of reach the tip of the spear uh, in order to interact with that customer. And the, and the growth is astonishing. If you look at the growth and the magnitude of e-commerce transactions globally, uh, it, it is a, um, by every measure, uh, just stunning. Um, we're talking about trillions of dollars of impact growing at compound annual growth rates uh, in, you know, at 20% levels, which is unprecedented growth in an industry of, of this size. The challenge, though, is that fraud is growing as well. Um, this last mile, this, this critical sort of touch point with the customer where products are being delivered is, uh, has become a vector for bad actors to, uh, to, to both you know, create economic casualties, if you will, for the companies that are engaging in e-commerce, but also to impact the experience that our customers are having. You know, you've got fraudsters that are taking over accounts that are spoofing and becoming the customer. Uh, you've got fraud systems that are attempting to protect against all of this that are creating false positives, which turn customers off when they should, in fact, be able to engage in a commercial transaction. And so it's a big problem very big problem with huge magnitudes of potential economic impact. And this is where we, uh, as a company, sort of stepped back uh, because we are ourselves a merchant, 
If you look at Microsoft, we're one of the world's largest, in fact, e-commerce merchants. Uh, and our commerce systems span not just e-commerce, but physical environments. We operate retail stores across the globe. We've got in-product systems. If you're a user of Xbox, you can purchase games right inside of the Xbox console or experience. If you're using Office 365, same thing. So we have all of these channels that we're engaging with our customers and all of these experiences are bringing back to us data signal that we can use to go gain intelligence. Uh, and, and it's this experience, and you can see the numbers, they're enormous, um, the, in particular the 800 million almost customers that we have a direct relationship with at Microsoft. All of this data, all of this experience uh, led us to uh, want to wanna obviously address the, the fraud challenge um, but when we went out to the market to find a solution, what we found was there was nothing that would really meet our needs. Uh, there was a huge opportunity that we identified a gap in the market where we invested heavily to go solve the problem. And there are four sort of uh, paradigm, paradigm shifts or, or four areas of innovation that we rallied around in order to go take the assets that we had, the data that we have, um, and, and to attack this problem on behalf of our customers ultimately. The first was connected knowledge. We already talked about that. If you can take signal from your products, from your customers, from your people, from your operations, and you can bring that together uh, in order to, uh, to, to gain knowledge and then apply that with an adaptive system that takes that knowledge, acts on it, learns, and then adapts in a continuous basis. Uh, if you can, through operations research, engage with the fourth one, bank collaboration, where you've got the financial services institutions that ultimately have to approve or deny transactions. If you can find a way to engage with them and to provide signal back and forth because there's information asymmetry between us with the customer relationship in the bank that has relationships with other merchants, this ability for us to take that knowledge, build an adaptive system, pair with the bank through, uh, through an OR mechanism that we're gonna talk a lot about here, and then build a relationship with those banks over time, uh, led to an outcome that we think is, uh, is phenomenal. Uh, and to take us through some of those details, uh, I'm gonna have Jay come up, but before we do that, the, the numbers again are staggering for Microsoft. 9.07% lift in our revenue, uh, a $76 million reduction in OPEX over a one-year period. You combine those two things, and this is very material uh, impact, both on the top line and the bottom line, for the world's uh, largest company uh, by market cap today. And so to get into some of the details, I'm going to have John come up and take us through uh, e-commerce and fraud management. Thank you very much, James. <clears throat> As James said, I'm John Beaver. I'm Director of Engineering. Uh, Go the right way here. So as business and operations move online and become real time, they provide high efficiency, low friction, and great customer experiences. However, the relative anonymity and ease of access they offer can become a vulnerability when it comes to fraud. Modern fraudsters can attack at scale anywhere in the world, anytime they want. This has led to online merchants facing a wide variety of complex and ever-evolving threats that you can see here. As just one example of financial fraud, when the Venezuelan currency crashed, people in Korea discovered that they could go directly to the Microsoft online store in Venezuela and buy products at massive discounts due to various exchange rates and Venezuelan pricing policy. This quickly became viral, and within hours, millions of dollars of Microsoft products, primarily Windows 10 licenses, had been bought for pennies on the dollar. Our system noted the unusual purchase patterns and alerted us to the potential problem. We were able to step in, block the scenario, and recover almost all of the lost funds by proactively refunding the purchases. Of course, payment fraud remains front and center, and that's what we'll focus on here. Consider a typical successful shopping experience, something that most of us experience daily. A legitimate shopper chooses to buy a product in the store of a merchant and provides her payment card. <clears throat> That information gets transmitted via intermediaries to the bank that issued the card and holds the customer's account. The bank will validate the request and decide whether it should approve the purchase. If it approves, the funds from the account are paid to the merchant and the merchant ships the product to the customer. The cardholder receives her statement at the end of the month and makes a payment. Sounds nice and simple, right? Well, things can go wrong in a few ways. First, due to the ever-rising threat of fraud, the issuing banks tend to do a conservative risk assessment and may reject the transaction if things don't seem just right. A large number of legitimate purchase attempts are wrongly prevented from completion in this manner. 
In fact, because the banks see e-commerce transactions as being so risky, acceptance rates for e-commerce in the U.S. average around 84%, while traditional brick and mortar rates are typically around 96%. When customers are rejected, they may do one of three things. They may try a different card, they may try a different merchant, or they may abandon the purchase altogether. The fraction of e-commerce opportunity lost due to such rejections is very large, conservatively 10 to 20%. The other thing that can go wrong is, of course, payment fraud. It's an unfortunate fact that fraudsters can easily get a hold of the payment information of a legitimate cardholder from the dark web. The fraudster uses the stolen payment instrument to purchase a product from the merchant. As before, the bank sends the money to the merchant, and the merchant ships the product to the fraudster. However, the real owner of the payment instrument notices this unauthorized charge on her billing statement and disputes it with the bank. The bank reverses the charge and files a chargeback. At this point, one of the key differences between e-commerce and traditional brick and mortar commerce kicks in. When a card is physically swiped as part of a purchase, the issuing banks accept the liability and absorb the charge chargeback. However, when the card has not been swiped, but just a card number entered, as within all e-commerce transactions, the liability is with the merchant. This is because the banks, for technical, competitive, and legal reasons, have neither the rich contextual data available to the e-commerce merchant, nor the physical assurances of a card being swiped. This data asymmetry limits the ability of their systems to adequately detect fraud and therefore their willingness to accept liability. So, the e-commerce merchant loses the revenue from the transaction, the cost of the goods shipped, and a set of chargeback fees assessed by the network. This has meant that as e-commerce has risen, it has become increasingly important for merchants to have their own strong fraud management system that can control fraud while ensuring that good transactions are not stopped. A merchant's fraud management system, or FMS, is similar to a great driver. The basic goal of a car driver is get to point A to point B, but she needs to be aware of far more than her route. She will watch her traffic signals, the actions of other drivers, changing weather conditions, and a myriad of other concerns. A fraud management system is no different, though rather than other drivers and road hazards, is dealing with its own set of actors. First, we have the professional fraudsters. Fraud is a big, profitable business, which means that fraudsters are well-funded and have the resources to continuously innovate. The FMS needs to continually adapt and react, or fraud will grow unchecked. Next, we have legitimate customers whose behaviors are also continuously changing. If the FMS does not evolve with these changes, it runs the risk of rejecting ever-increasing numbers of good customers. Fraud management systems usually take advantage of human judges for a subset of transactions in a process called manual review. This gives the FMS quick and accurate labels, as well as providing a human fallback for decisioning. However, if the FMS sends too many transactions, costs go up, quality of labels go down, and customers who are waiting for their orders are inconvenienced. The issuing banks are another critical player. They are continuously learning and adapting their acceptance rates based on the mix of traffic they receive from the merchant. So the FMS must co-optimize in order to derive higher acceptance rates. The FMS must consider market perception about the safety and security of the e-commerce experience. Consumers are obviously reluctant to transact with sites with a dodgy reputation. Finally, the FMS needs to adapt to business needs, such as ensuring viral adoption of a new product and avoiding dampening of demand due to conservative acceptance policies. Just as the driver needs to understand how reacting to one factor will impact others, the fraud management system needs to balance across all these interests and find an optimal path through them. So, the merchant's fraud management system must observe signals from all the players in the ecosystem, anticipate what they will do next, and adapt its control policy to help ensure long-term profitability. At a high level, we have the following straightforward profit equation that the FMS aims to solve. On the plus side, we have the margin of good transactions that were allowed to happen by the merchant and the banks. On the minus side, we have the cost of goods sold, loss of the fraud that happened, and the operation cost of the fraud management system itself. To achieve high profit, we need to simultaneously drive higher bank acceptance, lower false positives, lower fraud loss, and lower manual review costs. Of course, pulling all these levers simultaneously is a great challenge, and this is where Microsoft's technology innovations have borne great success. Now let's hear from Eric, the leader of Xbox business, about their experience with Modern Risk, our FMS. Microsoft's Modern Risk system provides Xbox with confidence in our digital sales growth. Our close partnership has enabled us to successfully launch and support new, inherently riskier scenarios across our platform. One recent example was enabling customers to gift digital content to other gamers. Our Modern Risk team was able to highlight both the general and specialized protections we put in place for this scenario, which really put our content providers at ease with this new feature. The integration with the fraud management system for all payments allows Xbox to focus our efforts on providing the most compelling gaming and entertainment platform 
without having to invest directly in financial risk management capabilities. Over the years, the close partnership between Xbox and the modern risk team has paid many dividends for Microsoft through their adaptive AI, which makes millions of decisions quickly and accurately while conforming to our business rules and needs. This is a clear example of us working together as one Microsoft by leveraging the strengths of multiple groups across the company to create even more value when combined. Morning, everyone. My name is Jay Nanduri. I'm the general manager for the fraud management system at Microsoft. So uh, as John explained, the fraud management system at Microsoft is embedded inside the purchase flow. Each incoming purchase transaction goes through, uh, we call it FMS, uh, and it needs to approve, reject, or review a transaction. Approval or rejection or real-time decision, however, the manual review decisions take few hours. Ultimately, they result in an approval or a reject of a transaction. And an accepted transaction then actually is sent to the banks so that the authorizations can either be approved or denied by the banks. So now, let's go a little bit double click into the fraud management system itself. So Microsoft fraud management system consists of two distinct but interacting components. Uh, first one is uh, risk evaluation. Uh, this consists of adaptive machine learning uh, modules to estimate the risk of fraud in every transaction we process. And the second one is a risk control subsystem which takes these estimates that are done by the risk evaluation and decides whether to accept, reject, or review the transactions. And the main goal is to achieve sustained long-term profit and also smooth customer experience. And there are significant patented innovations in both of these subsystems, leading to a very powerful solution. Now let's look into the details of each one of them. First starts with the risk evaluation. So risk evaluation is, is to classify the transaction into good and bad transactions. So for this, we use artificial intelligence and machine learning for this purpose. Specifically, we use gradient booster trees and deep learning uh, uh, for ML modeling. We are obsessively focused on optimizing our ML models for accuracy of the decisions or classifications. Risk evaluation can lead to wrongful rejections. We, they are known as uh, false positives. And in the same way, you can have wrongful acceptances, which are known as false negatives. And due to the difference cost margin, the impact, and everything, every false positive and false negative are not created equal. So for example, I can, I can have 1,000 of my $1 purchases on an app store and make money off it, but I could wipe out all the margins by making one mistake on a $1,500 Surface laptop. So the models, in effect, need to be optimized for accuracy as well as the weightage of the impact of the decisions. So the aim of the risk evaluation, as I said, is to produce a score okay, in real time because it will have less than 200 milliseconds, which is an estimate of probability of fraud the graph shown on the left side actually shows the distributions of the bad and good transactions across a risk score that we produce. The, the score's main aim is to actually separate good transactions from bad, but no separation can be perfect because at the time of the transactions arrive and the knowledge we have. So, and also if you see on the right side, the fraud, you know, e-commerce, uh, uh, you know, statistical attributes are ever changing. Customers keep changing their buying patterns, products go viral, or sometimes they're out of sync, and the rhythm of online retail varies with events like holiday purchases or back to school sessions and things like that. Similarly, fraudsters are always on our case. They keep changing their attack vectors in order to stay under the radar. And all taken together, these dynamic patterns make the problem of this risk evaluation very challenging. At Microsoft, we have solved this challenge by using advanced machine learning models that work on a connected real-time contextual data from diverse sources. And let's look into the details of what exactly does look like. So first, what we do is we cast a wide net on the gathering of the information that is pertinent to the transaction. The first is, okay, the context is uh, who is the transaction? Okay, who actually is doing the transaction uh, in this which is the email, which user, which email, what phone number. And the second we go after is the location. Okay, where is the transaction happening? 
Where exactly the good ship to? What is the billing address of the credit card? And the third, we go into some of the uh, how. Okay, we go into the device forensics, IP address, or what are the device characteristics and things like that. And last, we go about, not the least, is product. What product are you trying to purchase? What is the profit margin of this product? What is the product type? You know, what is, is this product revocable? And so on. Remember, some of this data is only available to the merchants, not to the banks. And this is where actually the difference between the e-commerce and the kind of a, a brick and mortar commerce comes in. And we'll go a little bit into the detail. So then as a second step, what we do is now that we got all this contextual data for doing a good analysis, we need to bring them together so that we can do linkage analysis at you know, kind of at the kind of the scale that we want to do. So we take care of, we take all this knowledge and f at the first step and every transaction across every business of Microsoft into a connected knowledge graph. And for example, as you see in the bottom of the, uh, of the picture diagram, if a, a two transactions that are attempted to go through a same device will get connected in the graph via the edges that goes through the device node. So if a transaction is later confirmed to be fraud, any transaction, and all this information is annotated back into the node. So with this, what we are actually achieving is we are breaking the silos of the business or the business groups because all the data is connected together. As you know, James referred to, we have almost touching 800 million, which is 760 million active users, monthly active users that come and they do about billion transactions every year. And now you can look at how big the graph is going to be. It's extensive and nearly seven petabytes of data and hundreds of billions of nodes and edges. Moreover, this graph needs to be kept near real time fresh because fraudsters are not waiting on us. They're going to do it every second. So this connected real time view lets us create these thousands of very deep machine learning features that we use in our risk models, giving exceptionally high detection accuracy. For example, you know, we do a very interesting thing. Using this connectivity of the knowledge graph, we compute these clusters of the nodes and we call, let's say we call them islands. Okay, so you start seeing, you see in the top picture, we started seeing that these islands start bunching up. Okay, and when in the island I see that a bad transaction or few bad transactions comes in, we go and mark that island as a fraud island. What it helps us is across a business, whenever any of the entry that touches any of this fraud island, we don't let the transaction go through or we do a stricter evaluation. So the idea of this connected graph at scale and its utility is one of the paradigm shifts in the company. So the next uh, third step, we build actually specialized models over the graph-based features. As mentioned you know, previously, what we do is the main challenge in the risk evaluation comes from the dynamic risk pattern. Remember, they were changing a lot. The ML models need to learn how to detect new patterns, and also they should not forget the old ones. To do this effectively, we use an advanced technique called cascaded long-term, short-term models. It is, as the name actually specifies in this cascade, what the long-term model is trained on is in a year's worth of data, and it is trained every two weeks. And we take about 500 million plus sample records and actually train on them. And its main job in life is to detect classic fraud patterns and remember the fraud patterns that have been used already. And the short-term model is trained on, you know, recent two weeks worth of data, about 15 million plus records. It consumes the long-term model score also. And its life goal is to detect the new and emerging fraud patterns. So together, this cascade attempts to, you know, take all the fraud and efficiently mops up all types of the fraud. And this patent pending uh, idea of long-term, short-term adaptive models is another paradigm shift that we have given in the company and beyond. As mentioned earlier, you can see the score is an estimate of fraud. And in real life, as I said, it's very hard to separate every bad transaction from good. So we cannot stop all fraud without affecting some good customers. At Microsoft, we are obsessively focused on happy customers. So this behavior, you know, you can see this behavior is captured in the ROC curve on the right side. Uh, which is called re receiver operating characteristic. And you can see two curves here. One is yellow and green, which is our curve in 2016 versus color in 2018. So each point in the curve 
shows a possible trade off between detecting fraud and allowing good transactions so when we choose any point on this operating curve we call it an operating point we can pick an yellow point in order to stop more fraud or we can uh, go to the gray point to stop you know kind of, to allow more good transaction recall the uh, profit equation that john showed the simple profit equation both these extremes will not reserve result in a good you know profit so the optimal operating point is somewhere in the middle actually it's like a blue point or it's in a range in general and this is where we'll go more into how we pick this for each transaction you know uh, you know we'll go into that more interestingly the advances that we made in this ai system for the risk evaluation means that the entire operating curve is now substantially better than what it was in our baseline 2016 and we are 3000 basis points more than where we were in 2016 in addition you know that there are several parties in the approval flow so and each party makes a decision based on the data that they have because of which this problem is just simply not a decision science because this problem needs operational controls so that the merchants can treat the interaction between these parties and what is the job of risk control system is what anand will go into and before that we'll see a brief video from joey one of our customer uh, uh, business leader in azure uh, commercial business and see what he has to say uh, about uh, uh, this system which is called modern risk in the company thank you at azure we are driving huge growth across the red hot tech space the ever expanding product line and capabilities within our cloud platform also attracts opportunities for fraud since microsoft's modern risk system is agile and can react quickly to emerging fraud and can make appropriate changes in the fraud control mechanism we don't need to be extra conservative in choosing timeline and scale of rollout for new product launches We also don't have to be restrictive in our risk rules. Microsoft's modern risk system enables us to power launches with correct market perception during the launch phase. Wrongly stopping such new customers during the launch can put a big damper on the uptake. Together, we make sure customers face no difficulty in accessing newly launched products, which contribute to Azure growth. For example, our Azure free trial offer is running at historically low fraud rates. Now that you have seen how risk evaluation works, uh, let us see how the risk control module works. While risk evaluation renders a score about the risk of fraud, it is the job of the risk control module to interpret that score and make a decision about the transaction. The billion dollar question with a big B is what is the best decision policy? We don't want an approach that maximizes the current expected profit. <coughs> that is short sighted. There are many interacting parties in the ecosystem. They are all reacting to our risk control policy, which affects Microsoft's future profits. The reaction of these parties is described by their response curves. For example, the figure below shows one critical response curve, that of the issuing bank. If the traffic we send to the bank consists of only low risk transactions, the bank reacts to it over a few weeks and increases its acceptance rate. Conversely, if we start including risky transactions into the mix, over time the bank will significantly reduce its acceptance rate. This is an automatic reaction of the bank's risk engine. If we ignore these bank interactions, we may operate at a very suboptimal point of the profit curve shown above and hurt long-term profitability. Rather than anticipating the response of issuing banks, we were only reacting to it after the fact. The resulting seesaw behavior in our risk control was putting a dent in our long-term profit. hence we were determined to solve this problem in a systematic data driven fashion we applied operations research and developed an algorithm called prospective control to achieve and maintain an optimal opting point where long term profit is always maximized to develop this solution we first had to find a suitable probability model by analyzing historical data we came to the conclusion that a partially observable markov decision process was a good model the state of this process is defined by a set of conditional probability functions that we lovingly call gold functions because they determine how money is made these are joint conditional probabilities that capture the risk posture of every party such as banks and reviewers for a transaction of a given risk score for example 
one gold function is the probability that both our FMS and the bank will approve a transaction that is fraud and has a score R. Based on the observed reaction time of various parties, we found that it was sufficient to model the state transition at a daily grain. So one epoch of the Markov chain equals one day. Notice that the current rewards today depend on the current state, but the decisions made today also affect the future state and therefore future rewards. With this Markovian model in place, we can now systematically formulate and answer the question, what is the best decision policy? Using dynamic programming, we formulated the Bellman reward equation, which says long-term profit now equals current profit plus a discounted future long-term profit. We solve this equation for the optimal control policy such that at each epoch we maximize the long-term profit. The problem has a very high dimensionality and it does not admit an analytic solution. Instead, we use numerical Monte Carlo methods. There are three steps. Step one. We estimated the current state from mature historical data as well as immature data with AI prediction. Step two, we applied real-time heuristics, greedy heuristics, to predict how this current state will evolve in the future in response to our current actions based on our most up-to-date estimate of the response curves. And in step three, finally, we took a representative sample of historical transactions and evaluated them under this projected future state to estimate the future reference profit. This is the training stage of prospective control, which happens at a daily grain. At every epoch, at every transaction, we could now optimize the total long-term reward over all available actions and choose the optimal one. This is the decision state, which must be in real time. The idea of optimizing long-term profits has been one of the biggest paradigm shifts driven by our work. Things become even more challenging because the response curves of various parties change over time due to the varying fraud pressure and world events. For example, since the Payment Services Directive, or PSD2, was issued by the European Union, European banks have become considerably more conservative in their risk posture. This is shown by the red line in the figure. These changes mean that the Markov model parameters keep evolving, and we cannot hope to achieve a time-invariant optimal solution. Rather, the optimal solution also keeps changing over time. What we need is an adaptive mechanism for tracking that optimal solution. The good news here is that the tracking is automatically achieved by the real-time greedy heuristics because they estimate the response curves on the fly with recent mature data as well as immature data using AI forecasting. It is thus an instance of adaptive dynamic programming. As the e-commerce environment ebbs and flows, our system automatically adjusts to the new response curves and finds and maintains the new operating optimal point. So you see, just like the risk evaluation model module had long-term, short-term models to adapt to evolving fraud patterns, the risk control module too can adapt to the changing posture of all the players in the ecosystem. Together, these adaptive mechanisms do an excellent job of tackling the challenges of a dynamic fraud environment. But wait. There is more. Everything we said so far was about anticipating and optimizing for the behavior of banks. This is a reactive strategy. We went one step further and became proactive. We shared contextual trust knowledge with banks. The trust knowledge is the risk assessment provided, produced by our risk engine, which is increasing the bank's understanding of each transaction. This mitigates the data asymmetry that John referred to earlier, while still respecting the concerns around privacy, and competitive intelligence. We currently have such collaboration with more than 60 issuing banks worldwide, and it covers the majority of our e-commerce traffic. What this collaboration effectively does is that it lifts up the entire response curve of the bank. For a given traffic quality, the bank will now provide a significantly higher acceptance. Since our system is adaptive, as soon as this knowledge sharing goes into effect, it automatically senses this new response curve and tunes itself to a new operating point. This gives us an even higher level of operating, long-term operating profit. This patent-pending idea of boosting bank acceptance by sharing trust information with banks is another big innovation that we have layered on top of all the previous work you have seen. This is a major paradigm shift, not just in Microsoft, but across the industry. 
In fact, we are now in advanced discussions with leading issuing banks as well as card networks to help standardize this pattern so that all merchants can benefit from it. At this stage, is it worthwhile to summarize the arc of our journey so far? Up until 2016, our risk evaluation engine had difficulty simultaneously detecting classic as well as emerging fraud patterns across various lines of business. Similarly, the risk control subsystem optimized for current profit. It ignored the reaction of players like issuing banks, which reduced long-term profit. Solving both these issues was the opportunity that we addressed in 2017 and 2018, and we continue to innovate even now. We developed new AI technology to efficiently detect both classic and emerging fraud patterns. We use advanced OR-based control algorithm called prospective control to optimize the long-term profit by accounting for the reaction of players like banks and manual reviewers. Moreover, we achieved an additional lift by proactively collaborating with banks. James will now come back to talk about the stellar impact that this journey has, had, has enabled for Microsoft. But before that, let us hear from Sterling McBride, who leads the manual review operations business at Microsoft. Microsoft's modern risk system has enabled us to keep review volume under control even as our business expands. This allows my team to leverage the quality and intuition provided with human reviews by concentrating on the truly ambiguous transactions and new fraud patterns, rather than being overwhelmed with a high number of reviews tied to commerce volume. This has resulted in a big improvement in quality of manual review assessments. The adaptive nature of our modern risk system really shines during exceptional periods of traffic, such as holiday demand, which historically has allowed fraudsters more opportunity to hide within the higher volume. Now, we can operate efficiently and predictably while continuing to generate the most business value. So, as a leader at Microsoft, as a business leader at Microsoft, I can speak uh, for a long time about the impact that this technology has had on my business and on the rest of the business. But I think uh, perhaps more interesting is what our CFO has to say. So Dave O'Hara, who is our chief financial officer, uh, let's take a listen to, uh, to the impact from his perspective. Hi, I'm Dave O'Hara, the CFO for the Microsoft commercial business. At Microsoft, we're always looking to improve our operational efficiency. Keeping fraud losses under control is a high priority for us. We also want to enable a trusted and delightful shopping experience for our customers. Over the last couple of years, our internal fraud management system has reduced fraud losses by 52 basis points or $75 million in savings. We've also reduced the reliance on transaction manual reviews by over 70%, which has further reduced costs and improved the buying experience. These are notable improvements in our operations. The system has also significantly reduced wrong rejections of good transactions. This improvement has resulted in a 138 basis point reduction in fraud management system false positive rate and a 769 basis point increase in the bank acceptance rate of our online transactions. Microsoft's innovations in our fraud management system have enabled paradigm shifts in the company as well as the broader industry. We've shown it is possible to simultaneously achieve both low fraud and high customer success by using advanced machine learning and operations techniques, as well as collaborating with issuing banks. The innovations in Microsoft's fraud management system made a very significant impact on the company's operations and profitability. We're very excited to see it get the recognition it deserves. Spoken like a true CFO. So the, uh, the impact has been phenomenal. I think the, the, the important part here is the balance across uh, reducing false positives, which is gonna lead to a much better customer experience while simultaneously driving up our profitability, increasing revenue. It's the combination of all these attributes that I think really makes this system stand apart. And if you go back to uh, sort of the four paradigm shifts that we've driven, it is this connectedness uh, of the data uh, pulling from these 800 million customers that we interact with on a monthly basis, combined with the adaptive system that we talked about, both for analyzing risk and then reacting to it, uh, and, and the relationship that we've established with financial services organizations, banks and uh, card payment processing uh, vendors that collectively allowed us to achieve these uh, results. Now, the results that we've achieved at Microsoft are fantastic, but I think I'm most excited about the results that we're gonna be bringing to our customers. And so we're taking all of this technology and we're wrapping it up 
into a product offering that's now in public preview called Dynamics 365 Fraud Protection. And so our customers, our partners, our financial institution partners are, are part of consortia now that are taking this technology and making it available for uh, not only uh, sort of business benefit for our customers, but to increase the size of the data that we're able to bring together. And it's this multi-step process from uh, you know, someone trying to do a transaction to the fraud protection system to our uh, uh, banking partners that, that really sort of brings it all together. And that's it.